again, everybody. Thank you for being here. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. For those of you that are visiting with us, thanks for being with us this morning. And uh, my name is Pastor Rich, if I didn't get to you. Uh, also, we were walking through the Sermon on the Mount. And so you come on a fun morning. And so somebody said, man, praying for your subject. I'm like, I didn't pick the subject. God did. I just go through it, and we have to go through it and deal with it. Here, we our philosophy is you got to preach what God puts in front of you. So <clears throat> we'll read it, and we'll get into that, and we'll get into our time together this morning. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he just last week talked about uh, adultery, and he just talked about the nature of cutting out those things that keep us from experiencing the full relationship with God that God wants us to have. And using adultery as kind of the, the example, he kind of feeds off of that to something else as he's talking through the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, he's always in the Sermon on the Mount putting himself on one side and the scribes and the Pharisees on the other. And he's explaining how the, to the disciples that their righteousness has to surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he's basically giving an interpretation of what the Old Testament actually meant to say since he's the one who wrote it. And so since he did that, he comes up to something else that we'll talk about today and dealing with issues that were directly related to the culture of the time as well. And certainly what we're talking about today is ingrained in our culture as well. Jesus says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Can we have an invitation? Amen. Father God, we thank you for this time of worship and wonderful time in your word. We pray your blessings as we open your word. Lord, as I pray every week, I pray I would decrease and you increase. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. Make us more like Jesus for your glory and your kingdom. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. When you come to a subject like this, something that is a sensitive issue in the life of the community, in the life of the church, you just got to kind of go through and you pray that God would just walk your way through it. Some of you probably won't agree with what I say today. Hopefully most of you will. Uh, all of us have different views when it comes to these things, and all of us have dealt with this. Divorce is a part of society. It is. The average length of marriage in America is 8.2 years. That's actually up. <laughs> Evangelical Christians, which is where we would fall under, are more likely to divorce than mainline Protestants. Wow, quiet on the second sentence. Divorce among those over 60 has doubled in the last 30 years. And divorce was an issue in Jesus' time as well. And he uses the Sermon on the Mount to deal with the issue as it relates to the scribes and the Pharisees on this issue of divorce. And so we're going to walk through it as well. Because in the kingdom culture, followers of Jesus seek God's ideal for marriage and do all they can to glorify and advance his kingdom through their marriages. Amen. So, let's talk about the issue in context. Jesus is dealing with an interpretation, or a couple of interpretations, that were prominent in the time that he was walking the planet. The quote is from Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. It's not an exact quote, because they didn't exactly quote it when it came to this, kind of like a lot of things when it comes to issues like this. 
Deuteronomy, it says, If a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, he may write her a divorce certificate, hand it to her, and send her away from his house. If after learning his house, leaving his house, she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the second man hates her, writes her a certificate, hands it to her, and sends her away from his house, or if he dies, the first husband who sent her away may not marry her again after she has been defiled because that would be detestable to the Lord. You must not bring guilt on the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. That's Bible, folks. That's that forgotten part of Deuteronomy, right? There were two schools of thought at the time. One was the Shammai school. It said sexual sin was the only permissible reason for divorce. And what we're talking about here is what does it mean, up back up in verse Deuteronomy 24, if a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her. That's where the debate comes in. What does that mean? The Shammai school said that that meant that there was sexual sin was the only permissible reason for divorce. The Hillel school said anything a wife did that displeased her husband was the grounds for divorce. Anything means anything. Which school of thought do you think was prevalent at the time? Hillel. Remember, women are not considered co-equals in society in the social ladder during this time. And this was the dominant view. I mean, anything. It could be anything. You put the napkins wrong on the table. Certificate of divorce. Some of y'all are just really running with this in your brains right now. And I know <laughs> now, the intent of the Deuteronomy passage was to protect the woman from frivolous divorce and character assassination. The purpose of divorce was to protect her, not him. And that's the, that's the context, and that's what Jesus is talking about and discussing through this. So what does this mean? So Jesus, again, it's the scribes and the Pharisees versus Jesus. Jesus knows that the Hillel school has become the prominent view of the day during his time on the earth, and he doesn't want this view to be the prominent view amongst his disciples who are followers of Je him, right? Followers of Jesus are not supposed to have that view because he's going to explain what he meant. Okay? Now, what is God's ideal for marriage? Ideal for marriage. All right? Let's just put it out on the table and discuss it right now. And for those of you watching online, and for those of you in here who may disagree with me, I make no apology. I believe this is what the Bible teaches about marriage. God's ideal for marriage is monogamous, one. Heterosexual, one man, one woman. Intimate, the two become one flesh. And enduring, which means for life. Marriage, in God's ideal, is monogamous, heterosexual, intimate, and enduring. Now, as Pastor Wayne and I had said years ago, we 
preach the ideal, and then I got to live in the real. We know this. Jesus knows this. Okay? Genesis 2.24. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife. They become one flesh. Okay? My, uh, you guys know this. When you got married, if you were able, you moved out. You moved out of mommy and daddy's house and you moved into your house, whatever that house was. Amen. It went, goes from being Krista and Rich as Rich, Christian, Rich and Krista, two separate people. My wife's name is Krista, for those of you that don't know. To it's Rich and Krista as one. How it's supposed to be. Okay? When I first moved to the first came to the desert, and for several years I used, visited the desert here. Many of you know that my wife's family, uh, her family owned that prom, Don Oaks Lumber and the lumber, prominent lumber yard there in the community for, for a very long time. And, and her dad was very well known in the community here on many levels, grew up here as well. And when I first came up here, I was Krista Oaks' boyfriend. And then I was Krista Oaks' husband. But over time, it is now Krista is Rich Springs' wife. But you think of one with the other. That's God's ideal. Now, Jesus talks about this more elaborately in Matthew chapter 19. I put it there in your notes, but you can follow in whatever is a larger, better font for you. I was telling somebody else here, you know, the font's small this week, and I apologize for that, but it had been a lot smaller if, I, if she actually put the Scriptures in there. So, uh, and this isn't even a third of everything that I plowed through to get to this point with our message here this morning. This is a, this is a, a difficult issue for many, many people to wrestle with in the church. And no pastor is oblivious to that. But we preach the ideal... And then we live in the real. Jesus in Matthew 19, they come up to him. Large crowds follow him, beginning in verse 2. And he healed them there. Some Pharisees approached him. Why? To test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? What school are they from? Hillel. For them, it's Yes. Whether they want to publicly state that or not, it's yes. <laughs> Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? See, when people say that Jesus doesn't talk about heterosexual marriage, how can you get around that just from this verse? Amen? Amen. He obviously talked about it. Right there. And it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked him, did Moses command us to give divorce papers, and to send her away. He told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but let's just understand what Jesus just said here. Jesus just said Moses permitted it because he knows us. He didn't say Moses permitted it because God wanted it that way. Amen? 
I don't think I'm going to get a lot of amens today, Ted. I'm going to have to really kind of bleed them out of you guys today. He told them, I, mean, I tell you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, what school was that? Shammai. And marries another, commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if the relationship of a man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. Now, it is one of the most fascinating sentences in all of Scripture. It really, really is. Because what, they're re what they've been taught their entire life is that, I ain't got to stick around for this. She don't do it the way I want it, like it, told her to do it. We're done. And Jesus comes along and says, unless it is for sexual immorality, adultery. Use the same word for both. We'll get to that in a moment. Then it seems to be no grounds. And they're just like, man, you mean, you, mean, you mean if she burns dinner, I can't divorce her? You, you mean if, 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 if she gives me the keys to the camel and he's thirsty and has no water, that I can't divorce her? None of that happens to you guys where the wife gives you the car on E and says, hey, I need gas. And it's like under five miles, and you're like praying you get to the gas station in time? Or No. And they're just like, man, that, it's just, that's just hard. It's an amazing response to that. It tells you that they've been taught that the intent, in their mind, of marriage was an easy way out. Does that sound really familiar today? As Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Malachi 2.16, many of us know this one. I put the two different, because it's translated two different ways. The, the Christian standard, which is what we normally use here, says it this way. If he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel... He covers his garment with injustice, says the Lord of armies. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. And that's more literally actually what the Greek actually, or the uh, uh, Hebrew actually says. But it's been translated for many, many years, and that's why I put it in here, because that's how most of you remember it. For I hate divorce, says the Lord. Now, it basically says the same thing up top. It just puts it in a more, more literal to the original framework. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart and do not be unfaithful to your wife. Now, before we move on, let's just make it real clear for those of us, maybe not so much in this service, but maybe you are there. I know I'm going to have to wrestle with this more in the next service just because of where people are at in life. God does not, let me say it this way, God strongly does not like divorce. Malachi says he hates it, depending on your translation. Or it says, don't act treacherously, don't be cruel. Divorce is brutal. And I get it, many of you in this room may have experienced it, whether in your own life, whether as a kid, growing up. For me, it happened when I was two years old. And then my mom remarried when I was 14. 
The consequences is what God sees here. It violates his created order. The two become one flesh. Jesus traces back to the Genesis account of the way things were supposed to be. The way God created them to be. But then out of the knowing the hardness of our hearts permits us. Now, some of you would say there's no. There's three different kind of views on it. There's a view that says no divorce is ever allowed. There's the, the, the view that says divorce is allowed, but you're not supposed to remarry. And then there's the, what's called the permissive view, which is taken to mean something it doesn't, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. So let's just get it out in the room. I don't know where you're at, for a lot of you. But if you've been divorced, that doesn't mean God liked it. It means he permitted it. God's ideal is monogamous, heterosexual, enduring. That's his ideal. I mean, otherwise, why would we say in our vows, till death do you part? It's struggling. It's hard to do marriages today. I used to not be a big fan of marriage counseling. Now, I won't do it unless I do marriage counseling. And even then, you're just kind of like really antsy and nervous because well, you do your part, then you do your thing, and then you hear about it later, and it's just like, you just lied. Well, I didn't lie at the time. Okay. God hates divorce. Let's just be very clear about it, okay? God wants me to be happy. I love that one. That's what they were saying. God wants me to be happy. She didn't cook my dinner right. She's out of here. What Jesus is really getting at here, folks, is he's really taking away the prevalent view of their time and the prevalent view of our time that there is such a thing as a no-fault divorce. And folks, California may have its laws, but we live under a higher standard. Or at least we're supposed to. i got to keep going. I'm going to run out of time really fast, which you guys are hoping for. I get it. All right, so let's talk about divorce and remarriage. See, Jesus over in Matthew 5 gives what's affectionately called or unaffectionately called the exception clause. And he uses the word for sexual immorality is the word horneia. Much discussion about the meaning of horneia. There was another word that Matthew could have used, or Jesus could have used, that talks about strictly adultery. But since we believe that God is the writer of the Bible, through the writers, we believe in the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. Amen. We believe in inspiration in that sense. He uses porneia. He uses porneia over in Matthew 19. Porneia has a very wide meaning. We get our word pornography from the word porneia. It can mean adultery. 
But it can also mean the sexual sins such as incest, homosexuality, molestation, and indecent exposure. Okay? All of those would qualify as sexual immorality. You think of them that way in your own brain. Jesus is clear that God permits divorce. He does not command it as the Pharisees thought and taught. So then the question becomes obvious, right? Because we're human. What's my out then? If that's not my out, Ted, then what's my out? i got to know my out. I believe the Bible teaches that divorce is permitted because of humanity's hard heart when marital unfaithfulness through sexual immorality, porneia, which includes heterosexual or homosexual relationships, bestiality, incest, and also desertion by an unbelieving spouse. And you can go to Paul's explanation over in 1 Corinthians 7. We do not have time this morning to delve further into to that stuff. I believe that that's what the Bible teaches. You don't have to believe that. We're not going to sit there and call you a heretic if you don't believe that. Don't call me a heretic because I believe this. I don't see in Scripture where Jesus doesn't say God permits in these cases, divorce. All right? Now, let's talk about one that's really prevalent in our world today. We need to kind of work our way through this one. And this is a very important issue. What about physical and emotional or mental abuse? There were many for many years who said, wife, in today's world you could say husband, And they're trying to be faithful to the Lord. You just got to suck it up. And I'm just going to be frank and blunt with you. Let that man beat the crap out of you. Don't divorce him. Let him treat you like dirt, but don't divorce him. Let him talk to you that way, but don't divorce him. Let him go out and play with his buds, and if he comes home, he comes home. You guys know I'm right. You guys, you guys, this is the older crowd. You guys know this was the view of the age for a very, very long time. So let's just talk about it, okay? First of all, physical, mental, and emotional abuse is a sin. It's a sin. 1 Timothy 6.11, Paul says to Timothy, But you, man of God, flee from these things, pursue righteousness, godly, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Peter, in 1 Peter 3, talking about husbands, says, Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives with an understanding way as with a weaker partner, showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. How are you honoring your spouse when you're abusing your spouse? How are you showing faithfulness to them by doing that? You're not. If the abuser is a believer and a member of a church, 
The church, I believe, has the authority to say that that person, the abuser, is not a believer. At least as we understand it. Ultimately, we don't know. But we say no. And since that person is functioning as an unbeliever, we're going to treat them like an unbeliever. And so they should be treated that way. And then Paul's phrase about desertion of an unbelieving spouse over in 1 Corinthians 7 comes into play. See, folks, here's the deal. Saved and sanctified followers of Jesus do not abuse their spouses. If divorce meets biblical grounds, remarriage is permissible. And folks, I put under immorality beyond adultery. I give a pretty wide view to porneia. I can make the argument that if you're going to go down that road with the wide, then you're pretty much abandoned your spouse, even though you may live in the same house. If God prefer, get, let's understand this. Hear me say this. Hear me say this. Hear me say this. God is always and always will prefer reconciliation and restoration. That's the business he's in. That's what we are to be ambassadors of. Paul says in Galatians 6, 1, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. God always, no matter how bad, and there are stories where this is true, wants us to pursue restoration and reconciliation, if at all possible. Did y'all write that down? So, in the few minutes we have left, let's kind of just let's just talk turkey here. Divorce used to have a stigma attached to it for women. You guys, have, some of you have lived here long enough to know that. But today, divorce is considered normative. Not only in the world, but in the church. Marriage has been reduced Reduced. I'm going to say reduced. Marriage is now considered something that the state does. And if you happen to have a preacher do it for you, that's okay. I was talking with a, 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 a friend this week. They're not believers. And they were discussing with me how they had to try and figure out how to get a, uh, some kind of authorization to do a wedding in Arizona because their sister's getting married and they want to officiate it. You guys do know, you can go online and you can become an officiant of a wedding. You don't need me. You don't need to have God present at the wedding. You 
You'd be a druid and be a fishian. God isn't pleased with either of those, neither the stigma or the fact that divorce is normal. Because neither reflect his standard or ideal for marriage, and neither are ministering to those who have gone through it. See, this is Pastor Rich coming at you right now. Some of you in here, I mean, I know, I mean, and Ed, you've probably met enough of these people in your day in ministry too. Man, there are some people just want to just want to declare anathema on people who've had a divorce in the church. Not nearly as much as it used to be. Want to go around and start calling them adulterers. It's not very pastoral. As if divorce and remarriage and then get rid of divorce of one and then go back to the other one really helps the situation at all either. Anybody who's gone through divorce, whether as a kid or as an adult, knows it's tough. It's hard. It affects your kids. See, you ought to be married for more than just because of the kids. And that ought to be more of a motivation. They ought to not be the only motivation to stay married as well. Why do you think divorce is up for those over 60? Because the kids all grew up. And the only reason to stay together was because the kids all grew up. And we didn't want to, you, you wanted to be hypocritical in front of them and show them that, that things were good and this is the way it's supposed to be. And then as soon as it, freedom comes to you, forget the freedom of the kids, freedom to you, it's, I got to look at you again? I got to talk to you again? I'm usually running kids around to practice or to this or to that and, and all these other things that totally took us away because what happens in society is children in homes, especially in some Christian homes, become the idol. And the most important thing in a marriage is God and then your spouse. And the minute you flip that stuff over, you have a problem. Marriage is not a fairy tale. It's not Camelot. Marriage isn't playing house. hard work. It is a constant, constant exercise in denial of self. And when we don't think of it that way, when we don't think about marriage biblically, then divorce becomes normative. And divorce should not be part of the vocabulary of any marriage. I mean, we live beyond marriage. Ted, now we live in the world of prenuptial agreements. Got to protect my assets before I start signing my name on the paper. Where does the two becoming one flesh meld into that? Well, in case something goes wrong. Why are you thinking that to begin with? Well, because things go wrong. Yeah? <laughs> and your point is what? Well, what's mine is mine. Amen? 
You guys know this. You, hear, you don't have to watch the Hollywood beat report to see all this stuff. This is lived out in the neighbors on our streets. It isn't easy. Let me just do an experiment in this room. I always love to do this in this room. How many of you in you... Uh, how many of you in here have been married for more than 10 years? Raise your hand. 10 years. Raise them high. Why? Come on. You, you've been married more than 10 years. 20 years. 25. 30. 35. 45, 50, 55, 50, your hand, I know, you're, I know the blood's starting to rush out, keep it high, come on, motivation here, keep it high, 55, 60, 61, I knew I had to cut it down at some point. 62, 63, 63. I'll bet you there was a whole lot of real life and a lot less fairy tale in those 63 years. Amen. But that doesn't mean that the marriage wasn't a fairy tale. Unless you're Barb. We all pray for Bob Grissom every single day. She knows. It's not a game. See, folks, in, in the church, we need to focus more on God's ideal for marriage. Listen to me and not trying to figure out whether we fit into the exception clause. What I deal with more than I would like to say is people always looking for the exception clause. And I really don't, after this service, come up and say, hi, good morning. I don't, you don't have to tell me good message, but don't come up to me and give me your Exception clause, please. Because ultimately, it really doesn't matter what I think, right? It's what God's Word says and what God says to you. In the kingdom culture, in the kingdom culture, read this with me. In the kingdom culture, followers of Jesus seek God's ideal for marriage and do all they can to glorify God and advance His kingdom through their marriages. If I can get an amen, say amen. 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 Father, thank you for this time in your word. On a, not a difficult passage, but it's given in a difficult time. Lord, we live in a world where marriage has been stolen from you. Marriage is your idea. That's why the disciples said, man, if this is the way it's supposed to be, it's, who wants to get married? But now we just make it so easy to get married and get divorced that there's no honor. There's no sacrifice. And Lord, for those in this room who have been married for a very long time, thank you for the witness of their marriage to your faithfulness in their lives through the ups and downs, dangers, toils, and snares. And while some, a lot of it's been really, really a blessing, God, some of it hasn't. But you've been there through all of it. Lord, for those that may be struggling in their marriages today, whether here or online, Lord, I pray they would seek you out. Seek your ideal. Seek reconciliation. 
Lord, you reconciled us through your son Jesus on the cross. That is the message you've given us to be ambassadors of. Let that be true in our lives personally and in the lives of our marriage. And Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Pray you have a blessed week. We'll see you next week here at Living Hope Church. Hey, don't forget to sign up for Asperity Days, guys. Need all the help we can get.